tuned in to the Community Cast podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cast podcast. I'm your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. And today we are speaking with the ever special Chris Roy from Dubert.com. Chris is a frequent flyer here at the Community Cats podcast. I think that this is either show number four, maybe five. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me back, Stacey. Excited to be here. <laughs> so Chris is a very good friend and the team at Dubert.com. Great friend of Community Cats podcast and also Positive Pantry too, which is an organization that's near and dear to my heart and that I am president of. Shout out and a thank you to Dubert and the team for helping to support us there. So really appreciate that. For folks that don't know what Dubert.com is, you should go to the communitycatspodcast.com website and just search in that search bar, Chris Roy, and you will come up with all sorts of goodies under his name. So please go and, and check that out. But I have not talked to Chris in quite a while. And I was wondering if we could just get a quick update of what's been happening at Dubert. Yeah, you know me. We never sit still, right? I'm always <laughs> trying to do new things. And, and honestly, we are. We're coming out with new features all the time. And we've really found a niche in our companion case management module. So as you know, I mean, Dubert is still the only platform out there that does transport. We're still the only platform out there that does foster management. We're still the only platform out there that makes it stupid easy for you to get video off of people's phones into your Dubert account. And then of course, to download it. So we've got all those features. And then our case management, we've really had a lot of success with, because to me, a case is anything. And what we've done is we really made this easy. We build you a custom form that you can stick on your website, which opens up new cases. And we've got really powerful features. Every case can have its own automatic workflow. So you can literally tell the case, you know, start this workflow and the workflow can say, you know, wait three days. And if there's not a response to the email, send this template. And then if there is a response, you know, change the status of the case and then wait another day. And if there's no response, send a text message. And if there is a response to the text message, do this. And if not, do that. We can do surveys that are automated through the workflow of a case as well. So Dubert is the only platform that does not just one-way text messaging. As I always say, that's like shouting. What fun is that, right? Nobody does that. So we have two-way text messaging. So every organization, even on our free plan, everybody gets their own phone number that nobody else in the world can use but your organization. So you can send and receive text messages. And so now when you start thinking about this, that's how we communicate. People do email, of course but we all get a million emails and you pay more attention to text. So we can, you know, open up a case from a text. We can do two-way text communication. Like there's all sorts of things that are really cool that we can do with technology. And so we're really doubling down on the companion case management module and the functionality that we're going to be building because I just see so much potential for where we're going. So those are just some of the few things that we've been up to here in the last, since you and I have last talked. So... I'm going to ask you to get even more specific with regards sure. to case management for those folks that might not be 100% familiar of really what does that mean? Does a case mean a colony of 10 cats in someone's backyard? Does a case mean somebody interested in adopting a cat? Does a case mean somebody wanting to surrender a cat? Does a case mean I need food for my own pets and I need assistance? What is a case? Yeah, those are literally... Stacy, four great examples of four different types of potential cases. And that's the point is you can have a form on the website for I need to surrender my animal. And that opens up a case where you can, it, the form will capture all their information, including their phone number and email, et cetera. And we've got a nice view in there where you can see all the open cases. Now you can communicate with that person right through the system. You can send an email, you can send a text message, you can receive an email and receive a text message that goes right back into that case. So if you're an organization, let's take Positive Pantry, for example, that is helping to facilitate, hey, I need food, right? All of these inquiries can be cases that you can keep track. So you can have inquiries on food, you can have inquiries on owner surrender, you could have inquiries on, as you said, 
cat colonies. A case can literally be anything. We have some organizations that are using this to manage their foster program. They found every foster, they make a case because we have animal profiles that are connected to these cases. Now imagine when somebody says, I need to surrender my animal, the forum takes all the information, including pictures and type of the animal and all these things, and creates an animal profile in your Dubert account attached to the case, right? You can now take that case. We can, of course, communicate with it, start automatic workflows on it. You can transfer that case to another organization. We've got all the reporting, so you can keep track of how many different types of cases that you did. And all that data is easily downloadable to Excel, so you can you know, report on it and use it for grants and all those other kinds of things. So it's one of those things where the idea of a case is so simple, and it can be literally almost anything you want. You can use it for all sorts of different types. One of the things we're working on is to create case templates. So if you said it's a foster case or an owner surrender case, the fields will change, right? To say, well, for an owner surrender case, you're going to want these 10 fields. And on a you know food inquiry case, you're going to want these 10 fields. So we're actually looking at building out templates as well so that you can have more dynamic information based upon the type of case. So that's why I see so much potential in this is we're trying to give organizations the tools to keep track of this and to communicate, again, through email, through text messaging, to make it easier for them to communicate with people from a particular case. So in my scenario, say there's 10 cats in my backyard and Mm -hmm. I have a case of TNR and then there's a litter of kittens that get trapped and I need to surrender them the database is relational? Is that the correct phrasing? Or they relate to one another? See, I'm like a Google Sheets person, or sure. I'm an Excel speed, and I don't necessarily know how information can talk to one another. Can you explain that? Yeah, I'll try my best. So yes, is the answer. So we have related cases. So imagine, let's take Stacey LeBaron as a person, right? So in your organization, if you've been communicating with Stacey, she's in the address book. And then cases are attached to Stacey based upon a unique identifier, such as her email or her phone number. Those are unique identifiers. So now you can see Stacey LeBaron, you know, inquired about food. Oh, wait, Stacey LeBaron has another case. This one was about an owner surrender. Oh, wait, here's another one. Stacey LeBaron reported a cat colony. And now you can view all of your cat colony cases if you want and see not just Stacy, but all these other people. So I think of it as, just like you said, you have the right words, relational, so that Stacey LeBaron, the person, if I want to look at Stacy and everything she's interacted with with my organization, I can see all the cases related to Stacy. But more importantly, I can have different people that are assigned to different cases. So for example, if you have owner surrender cases that are handled by one person and you have you know community cat cases handled by another person, right? So it's all within your Dubert organization, but you can have those cases managed by different case managers, if you will. Because in most organizations, that's what they do. They're just doing this via email. Well, as you know, it gets hard to track the email. Everybody has an info at, foster at, food at, surrender at, right? All those different emails which is fine and it works, but two things. One is you can't text from there, right? More people are responsive to text. And two, when it comes to getting all of the statistics, you can't easily get statistics because just trying to do all that stuff through email. And of course, we got the automated workflows that go along with it too. So it's a much better way to organize all the activities that are taking place in your organization. Yeah, and as you're talking, I'm just sitting here thinking about how many times have I gone into my email and like, searched to try and find like, what was that story about? Right. Or, you know, somebody will email me and say in, you know, 2021 on the third Thursday, I did this and I need that. And I'll be like, I'm searching <laughs> through to try and go way back into my emails. And that's one of the reasons why I archive everything. And that's why, you know, I store everything, which is probably wasteful. And there's probably duplication all over the place amongst my Google Docs and things are not kept current and other things, you know, or the current ones are not identified as well as some past items. So there's duplication and error there. So this sounds like a dream come true to me, honestly, in being able to keep track of that kind of information, as well as I know another concern, and I'm not sure if the case management goes this far, but what if somebody walks through the door, they want to surrender a cat and 
been told no, a $5,000 donor to the organization, but they don't know that. Sure. You're headed where I'm going. It's frustrating for an organization to have to use five different systems because you lose that single visibility, as you just said, Stacey LeBaron, the donor, Stacey LeBaron, the volunteer, Stacey LeBaron, the you know owner surrender, Stacey LeBaron, the adopter. Oftentimes, organizations have four or five, six different systems, and it makes it difficult to aggregate. That's something that I'm working on now to try and solve, right, is how do we make one system that you can use for all these things? So today, the case management, if you attract all of those things in cases, you could do it. But what I want to do is continue to build out the functionality in Jubert so that there's a fundraising module that you can use that now knows that Stacey LeBaron is also an adopter, is also a foster, is also a volunteer. So you have that universal 360 degree view of the person, because I look at this as those are people in your community and the touch points that you have with those people, they might start out as an owner surrender. They might turn into an adopter, a foster, a volunteer, a donor. There's so many different ways that people could go and you might want to target them differently based upon their interactions with your organization. So that's definitely something we're working on now. Let's talk about AI. You've had a lot Mm -hmm. of experience with it and discovering it and you work with it on a regular basis in your day job, I believe. What are your thoughts about how AI can help our community cat caretakers, people on the front lines? We've talked a bit about animal control before we hit the recording. So the people on the front desk at veterinary clinics, they're just bombarded with people going, there's no vet appointments. You don't want to help me. Nobody wants to help me. And are there ways for AI to maybe help relieve some of these pressures? Yeah, AI is definitely the hot topic, right? We hear about it a lot in the news. A lot of people are familiar with chat, GBT. There's, you know, Google's got barred. There's all sorts of different versions of it. And we're barely, barely scratching the surface right now, Stacey. I would tell you that AI is as revolutionary as the internet is, as mobile phones were. Like, I mean, it literally is that significant of an impact that we're just, again, scratching the surface. So There's two ways to think about this. AI is great at information gathering and analysis and summary. Depending on what tools people use, if you use like Microsoft Teams, even Zooms, I think sometimes now, it can actually listen to a meeting and give you a summary. It can take notes, right? It can do real-time translating. So some of these things are, they're really cool tools that are just being embedded into the tools that we're using. The other one that is probably really helpful or can be really helpful to organizations is chatbots, right? Sometimes people get annoyed with chatbots, but they're getting a lot smarter, a lot faster. This is actually something I'm looking at on the Dubert side as well as trying to build an animal welfare specific type chatbot. But the idea of chatbots is they can take large amounts of information and communicate to you in what they call natural language. So just like you can ask your Alexa questions, you can ask a chatbot question and it uses models to say, Instead of just a Google search, it knows what you're asking. It can respond to you in plain language and give you options and things like that. So I would say as we start looking at areas in animal welfare, and as you said, clinics and things like that, people want self-service. And a lot of times they get frustrated because they have to call. They don't want to call. I don't know about you, but me, I hate calling places. I never want to pick up the phone. I want self-service. I want to be able to go book my appointment, research, find information, get answers to my questions. And most of the websites today in animal welfare just have a contact us button. And it goes into a generic email that people don't get back to. So when I start thinking about what is the uses of AI, that's one way, right? We can incorporate technologies like chatbots that can give people a better interaction experience to hopefully get the answer to their question because they can use all sorts of information, including searching the internet to find the answer to the question. It's actually better to restrict the chatbot so that it's only looking at information we want it to look at, right? Otherwise, you're just doing a general Google search. So think about how we can make authoritative information, if you will. The technology is there today that we can restrict what the chatbot looks at. Mark your calendar. It's happening this Saturday. Join us this Saturday to learn the art of trap new to return, a powerful way to transform the lives of community cats. Brought to you by Community Cats Podcast and Neighborhood Cats. This session is for anyone who wants to turn their passion for cats into action. Whether you're a seasoned caretaker or just starting out, there's something for everyone to learn. Don't wait. Reserve your spot now at 
communitycatspodcast.com slash get TNR certified. Are you getting your message across to your entire community? Do they know what programs you offer and what they can do to help? Learn more about how to effectively market your organization or just sharpen your skills with a free self-paced marketing course, The Fundamentals of Marketing on Maddie's University. The course is designed to provide a basic understanding of marketing and provide you with templates and tools to elevate and improve your organization's brand, voice, and audience, and have fun while doing it. You'll receive a strategic marketing plan template to download free. Go to university.maddiesfund.org and search marketing to enroll now. Tomahawk Live Trap exceeds customers' expectations by providing them with the highest quality humane animal control products available. Check out their new Pro Series Gravity Door Trap. They feature a door that sets automatically when you open it. No hook or plate setting needed. Use discount code Keep It Humane for 10% off your order at livetrap.com. The other thing is analyzing and helping to come up with conclusions. So when you think about, as you mentioned, like appointment, you know, what are the reasons why, you know, how many appointments were canceled within a time frame? If the chatbot or or AI has access to the database of information. So for example, I could give it, you know, a system that looks at 10 years worth of appointments and I can ask it natural questions to do analysis, right? How many times were appointments canceled on a Thursday? You know, how many times was this reason given? And you're just asking it a natural question and it'll come back and do all the analysis and come back to you with a response. So there's a lot of cool ways that it can save time. The challenge is, you know, for things like that is somebody has to teach it, program it, if you will, how to do that. And that's probably the biggest barrier, but the technology is there. And I see a lot of use cases for it so that we can get, because most of the time when people want to run reports, they're looking to answer a question. Necessarily always looking for that list of, you know, 3,000 records. They're looking to derive an analysis. That's why people download it to Excel and put it in pivot tables and summarize it and all these other things, because they're looking to get an answer to the question. So the other side of AI is also very interesting and very scary at the same time. You'll hear a term called gen AI, G-E-N, and it's short for generative AI. You've seen, and the technology is there, you can use AI to generate an image. So I could literally tell AI I was playing with it myself just because it was kind of fun and cool to see what people come up with. And I told it, I said, generate an image of dogs and cats drinking tea and playing poker, just because I wanted to come up with the most random thing I could possibly come up with. And the computer generated images that didn't exist of exactly what I asked for. You kind of step back and you go, wow. And people go, okay, how are you going to apply that in welfare? This is where sometimes we have a solution in search of a problem. But I look at this and I say, okay, you can also upload pictures. I could upload a picture of Stacey LeBaron and I could put you skiing in the Alps or I could put you in a submarine underwater. I could put you anywhere in any photo. This is where it gets crazy now is it's hard to tell what's real and what's not. But now you start thinking about how can we use this to enhance things? So a chat GBT, for example, there's been organizations that have used it to write adoption profiles. So you can tell it, hey, go write an adoption profile for a dog named Sandy that's a fluffy dog that's great with kids. And the generative AI now can go generate exactly what you want. You can have it write resumes. You can have it write applications. You can have it do anything. So start thinking about how some of the tedious tasks that we have to do that are repetitive, you can have it write emails for you, right? You give it some parameters and it does the rest. What I would think would be cool is when it starts coming to adoption photos and things like that, being able to upload a photo and clean up the photo and lighten it and contrast and make it a much better looking photo. We have oodles of research that show better quality photos lead to more adoption, but people don't have time and they don't have the tools to do that. So how do we use that so that it does all the work for us and then places that back on our website? That's totally within the realm of what is possible. So there's so much that we haven't scratched the surface. You always know with me, I always tell people, give me the idea, right? Tell me, what's the crazy thing that you think could help? And I'm quite sure we could figure out a way to make it happen. So I'm going to kick it up a notch. Uh Uh-oh, now I'm in (laughs) trouble, okay? So you know I have my community cat pyramid. Yes. So with that being said, in my analysis, when you do a needs assessment in a community, 
you go out, you capture information that already exists out there. So social vulnerability index, you know, renter issues, you know, there's a component of maybe six different items where you're going out, you're capturing information on the different zip codes or census tracts, and you're putting a picture together of what the economic situation is like in that geographic area. Then you are also going out, you're capturing information like the number of spay neuter clinics, the number of adoptions happening in that community. So the, the amount of volume of cats being dealt with in that community. And then we are calculating an estimate of what are the services being provided versus what's the need in the community. And are we on balance with that or are we out of whack? from a collaborative standpoint. So in my olden times, it's get all the groups together, let them share all their information. Let's all, you know, have a workshop together. But now I'm looking at you, Chris, and I'm thinking, (laughs) well, we can just go get that information out in the public space and prepare a report that shows these are our strengths and these are our weaknesses in the community. And it's just right there. And then organizations have an understanding without doing a lot of foreplay, I guess I'll call it, and uh, have the information and say, okay, so this is where we're at. How do we get here? Or let's celebrate and party. We're doing the right thing. And we've got the maintenance. We're at our maintenance level, which, you know, if there are any communities at maintenance, that's beautiful. I think a lot of us will be seeing a shortage in spay neuter appointments in their community. But just to understand, are we looking at a thousand more appointments? Are we looking at 10,000 more appointments? It gives us scale. It gives us a goal. It gives us a number. And if we can do this easily through computers rather than ourselves and pen and paper, that gets us 75% of the way there, I think. Yeah, I think it's a great use case, a great example for how something like this could be used. Because what you can do is you can train it and tell it what sources to go to. And the cool part, Stacey, is not only could you have it generate reports for you, like you were talking about in doing the analysis, imagine now being able to ask it questions and have it know how to go get the answers to the questions based upon the data that you're limiting it to. So all of that information oftentimes generates more questions. But being able to train a chatbot that not only can produce those reports, like you said, you know, flip of a switch, really easy, but then be able to ask it trending information comparative information. One of the things that in my day job, you know, to give you an example, we had it in just 10 years worth of our company's annual and quarterly reports. Okay, great. You know, these are the big documents that public companies produce telling you everything, you know, about where they're going and all these things. Then we started asking questions to compare against the market, to compare against competitors, to compare against the stock index. And those are publicly available information. So it used the information we gave it on our company. And we said, do an analysis between our company and XYZ. And tell us, you know, we actually asked it, are we a good investment? And it went through and gave us the analysis and looked at the number of shares outstanding and the the treasury yields and the market fluctuation and all these other things. And it came back and said, yes, it's actually a good buy right now. And it was like, it came to its own conclusion which isn't something that is in our report. Obviously, in our company report, we want people to buy it, but it's not like we can, they're not going to be convinced, but this independent chatbot could do that. So that's really the power of where this can go is if we train it with model information, give it information to use, and then start thinking about how do we compare this against, to your point, the growth of the population in an area, the number of veterinarians that are being graduated from universities within a 250 mile radius. All of these are just data sets. So you imagine ingesting all these data sets, what we have to do is we have to train the model to say, okay, here's where you get the data sets and here's kind of what they mean, if you will. But then from there, the power for it to learn and grow is kind of crazy where this stuff is going to be. I think a year from now, we're going to be at a way different place than where we are right now. So I think there's two components that we're looking at here. One is the sort of front line, let me answer these basic questions, lighten the administrative load, get the workflow more efficient and work more effectively. People feel like they're getting connected because we always hear in animal welfare, nobody calls me back. There's nobody paying attention to me. This at least has a level of engagement. And, you know, a chatbot can also have in there, you know, I must talk to a human being or whatever. And then that will get funneled in a certain direction too. 
as we are all learning to be more automated, though, I think, too. I do think that the level of phone calls has gone down substantially in a lot of organizations, but there will be those holdouts that really want to have a phone call with someone. But the chat bot will take people through in a non-biased way. They're going to treat everybody the same way. They go through their flow chart. And then we can use also the AI component in our strategic planning concepts or programs. So we can do it as a geographic strategic plan, which would have multiple factors, or we could even utilize it for our own organizational strategic plan too. Yep. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of potential in everything that you just said. And, And I think what we need is a use case, a concept, just like what you came up with and say, okay, here would be a problem that would help us save a lot of time because there's just so much information, as you said, in your pyramid to go through and collect and get. If we could do that in the blink of an eye, we would be able to get more organizations to do it because it takes a lot of time and effort and skill to do that. That's what computers, as you know, are good for is let's churn large amounts of data into insights to enable us humans to be able to go take action on that. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I know you and I will be continuing this conversation. Before we close out, Chris, on the show, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? And please let folks know how they can find out more about Dubert.com. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. I mean, for sure, go to Dubert.com is the easiest place, right? We've got tons of information out there. The other thing I forgot to mention before, we have our Dubert Forward program. It's basically a replacement for Amazon Smile, but a thousand times better because People can shop for the same pet food that they buy on Chewy, same prices they get on Chewy, but we donate 5% to the organization they choose. So if all of your supporters for, you know, Community Cats Podcast go and they shop, we have, it prompts them to say, who do you want us to pay it forward to? Who do you want us to pay the 5% of your order to? And then as soon as their order ships, we pay your organization through PayPal. We send you 5% of their orders. If they spend a hundred bucks, you get five bucks. And this has proven to be be great for a lot of organizations because they get recurring customers. People need to buy food for their dog or their cat. And that's our goal is to, again, try and keep the money in the hands of rescues and shelters that need it. So you can learn all about the software that Jubert has. You can obviously check out the shop and encourage people to shop there. And I'm always open for new ideas. So I'm excited to press the envelope again with some of the chatbot stuff, with some of the AI stuff and see what we can really do to make a difference. Excellent. Chris, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on the show. And I know we'll have you on again in the future. (laughs) I know I will be back, Stacey. Thank you so much. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think. And a five-star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening. And thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats.